I want to get a couple of things across in this two hours. One is, what do we know about the effects of effective instruction? So I'm going to set up the very first part with, how do we know what effective instruction is? And I'm going to lay out what that is. And I'm going to use that as a springboard to talk about how would you use that to manage behaviors. So I want to start with kind of big ideas that we're going to go through in more detail. If we're talking about what an effective teacher is, the research leads us to three domains. Now, I teach a graduate class. I teach applied behavior analysis to master's students at the University of Louisville. And at the start of class, I always say, give me all the descriptors you've got of what would make a good teacher. And these are the words they always give me. Patient, kind, facilitative. And I don't disagree with any of those. But I don't think that having those things alone make you a good teacher. And the things they don't talk about when I ask them for those things are instruction and environment. Instruction. They don't talk about what does the teacher do to facilitate the instruction? How can the teacher make sure kids know exactly what it is we're talking about? How can the teacher find examples that are real for the kids? How can the teacher provide lots of opportunities to be engaged? We need to talk about those things if we're talking about effective instruction, whether you're teaching reading or math or science or behavior. Second, if you were wanted to bet on how effective a teacher was going to be or not be, the way the environment is arranged provides us some predictors for that. And when I ask our novice teachers, what is a good teacher, nobody ever says, Somebody who thinks out how to arrange physical space to set kids up to be successful. And yet that is a huge part of being a teacher. Whether you're a special ed teacher or a gen ed teacher, space, routines, consistency, and procedures are huge predictors. But those aren't things people think about. The things people think about are in the relationship domain, which is just as valid. But it's only one of three domains. I totally believe that if you do everything exactly right in instruction and environment and you have a poor relationship with kids, it won't work. But by that same token, you can have a great relationship with kids, but if you don't have good instruction, it's not going anywhere either. It's got to be all of the above. And so I want to start by just kind of thinking about what those pieces look like, and I want to talk mainly about evidence and facts. We do have evidence and we do have facts for this. And we can debate it, but I would say the debate should always come back to what are the facts. These are three big ideas I think we have to hit upon as we do this. One, what you do makes a difference. Some things work better than other things. That's a fact. There might be a hundred evidence-based practices out there, but they're not all equal. Some of them give you a better chance of making a difference given the kids you have, given the circumstances, etc. We have to be good at figuring out what practices to use. Second, every practice we use, if it's effective, is probably based on effective instruction. Teaching matters. What we do to deliver information to kids matters. And third, the teacher, him or herself, matters. There's a ton of research out there on the effects of quality teachers. When teachers do those first two things really well, the probability of kids' success goes up dramatically. And that's what I want to talk about mostly this morning is probability. Because there's no sure thing in our field. It's probability. What are the chances that this would work? So I like to think about these guys as setting a foundation for this. David Berliner. A very, very famous education researcher. Uh, he was at Arizona State University. He wrote a whole bunch back in the 70s and 80s with Jerry Brophy and Tom Good. So if you ever heard of the old Brophy and Good research, the effective schools research, they looked at thousands of schools, thousands of outcomes, and this is what he says. Kind of think about it like this. If you were to assess all of your kids, let's just make this up, in reading at the start of the year, 
And then for the rest of the year, you did no assessments. Now again, I'm not suggesting you do this. I'm just saying, what if? For the rest of the year, you do no assessment. At the end of the year, we're going to assess them again, and you all get to bet on how much um, achievement gain we get from each of those kids. If you've not been doing any assessment during the year, what would be your best bet for considering achievement? And according to David Berliner, it would be the degree to which those kids were engaged with your instruction daily when you taught. Engagement. Or as David Berliner says it, and I think you can't say it much more powerfully than this, the relationship between the time kids are actually engaged with what you do during instruction and their achievement has the same scientific status as the concept of homeostasis in biology, reinforcement in psychology, or gravity in physics. There is no debate in the field of education that engaging kids is a good thing. The debate, or the question I hear is, well, I would love for that kid to be engaged, but he's not. And my response is always, then what are you going to do to engage him or her? And that seems to fall on, that's not my problem. I already did what I'm supposed to do. They're not engaged. We need somebody else to come fix that. And I am very vocal about this when I work with schools. No, that's your job. If you do something and it doesn't work for kids, your job is to do something else. That's it period. And I think Bob Pianta says this really well. We as adults take that responsibility. The, the asymmetry in child-adult relationship systems places a disproportionate amount of the responsibility on the adult for the quality of that relationship. This is what Bob Pianta, who's the dean of University of Virginia's School of Education, this is what his research shows. The number of times during class or during school that a teacher and a student have an interaction that ends positively heightens the prediction for other positive outcomes for that kid, including achievement. So the question is, what do you mean by positive interaction? And if you really look at it, it is not negative. That's all we're looking for. I say to you, how's your day? You say, good. Okay. That counts. Now, if that's all we do is ask about their day and what they saw on TV, that's not going to give us enough because we're not in the instruction part, but that's part of the relationship part. It is, what could you, adults, do to engage kids in such a way that more times than not, how many more times than not, we'll talk about that later, more times than not, that inter interaction ended positively, or again, not negatively. So I hear all the time, well, every time I say that, we have a negative exchange. So how could you create an environment in which that would not be the case? And too often the response I hear is, that's not my problem. But it is your problem if you're an educator, because that's what our job is, is to create these successes for our kids. And to the extent it's not working, the responsibility comes back on us to try something different. And as a special educator, we know there are kids that you can do this for for a long time and still not see the effects. That doesn't lessen the responsibility. This is what we know. When teachers use really effective instruction, there is high rate of kid success. When there is high rate of kid success, kids develop confidence. And kids like doing what we're doing. All of us. When you're doing something you're good at, you want to keep doing it. It's fun to do things where you're successful. So good instruction sets kids up to be successful, which creates a positive relationship, which makes instruction work even better. And what we get is this respect back and forth. I like that teacher because I'm successful. I like that kid because he or she's successful. And we can show this pattern over and over and over. And it gets to be simply like this. Every single time a kid is successful with anything you ask them to do in school, statistically increases the probability they'll do it again. So, how many times do you need to make a kid successful before they'll do it on their own? I don't know, but it's a lot. At one point in your life, somebody had to do that with you for reading. Now, I'm guessing all of you read the newspaper every day, and nobody ever comes up to you and says, hey, good job sounding out. 
They did once. And they did that to give you the knowledge of your success so that you could keep going. And eventually, your success was enough to keep it going. And the teaching part could fade out. But teachers start this. And without effective instruction, the relationships just don't happen. So again, I get we need to have teachers that have the idea of how to have a good relationship. But that without instruction doesn't create the confidence we need to make kids really successful. So I want us to think about this big idea. This is kind of the way when I got my teaching certificate, this is the way I was taught. Don't even try to teach academics until you get all those behaviors totally under control. And my first job as a teacher was in a lockdown setting. And um, how far through the year was it before all the behaviors were totally under control? Okay, right, never. So what's the point? What am I trying to control behavior with? How do I, if you think about success and confidence, how do I give these kids a reason to believe they should be here doing something because they're getting better if I'm not teaching them, if I'm just trying to sit on it the whole time? There's no logic to that. In fact, the reality is, again, every single success you create increases the probability of another one. So, think about a simple logic like this. I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I want to see a kid that has a successful day. If I follow this kid all day long and see nothing but successes, every adult in your school gets a $10,000 bonus. Should I pick the kid I watch or do you want to pick the kid? Which kid would you pick? Would you pick the kid that's had one successful day this year? Here's your choices. This kid's had one successful day this year. I should follow her. This kid's had 12. Should I follow her? He's had 1,000. Which one of them is more likely to have a successful day tomorrow? You know, every single time a kid has another success, it predicts more success. How do we get all of our kids to be like that? By making it happen today. You've got to create those successes every day. And that's where effective instruction comes in. We have to deliver this in an effective way. And we know what those are. So I want you to just think about this normal curve. As all the kids you know, some of them are very successful, some not as much. Most of them are right in the middle. Here's what I want you to think about. If I said to you, I'll give you $10,000 if I come to your school tomorrow and see a kid having a problem behavior, would you just pick randomly from within this curve? No, it's predictable. You'd pick from this end of the curve. Here's what we'd want to know about any kid who is on that end of the curve. If we put an intervention in place tomorrow, how far would that move that kid up that curve? Because that's a really important outcome for us. So if we have two interventions we could use, one moves him a statistically significant amount up the curve of this much. This is an evidence-based practice. We've got all the evidence out there that says, if you use this, it moves kids. We've got another intervention that moves kids this much. Are they equal? Well, very often they are in the eyes of what we do in education. In reality, they're not. And this is kind of what we've done. We've set up this artificial criteria for best practice. It would be as if I said, anybody in here who crosses the finish line in this race is an evidence-based runner. I've set out cones outside for a 10-mile run. Go. And let's say some of you show back up here again in a little over an hour. And some of you, three or four hours. Some of you trickle in tomorrow morning. And a bunch of you never come back at all. But of the ones that came back, somebody could come to me and say, I need somebody to run a leg in a, in a big race. We get a million dollars if we win. Do you have a great runner for me? And I said, these are all evidence-based runners. <laughs> they are, 
But that's only because I drew a line and said, if you go above this line, you're there. And that's kind of the way we've set up what we look at for evidence-based practices. Instead of saying, which ones crossed the line, we should say, which ones gave us the biggest effect in the fastest way? Because efficiency is also important. What we can do is, we can go out there and look at all the interventions that the world has, and we can say, not only are they evidence-based, but how big of an effect do you get? If the effect you get is a full one of these bands, which are standard deviations, that's called an effect size of one. That's gigantic. We don't really have many interventions out there that move kids that much. Most of them are less than that. In fact, what we know is that the average kid in the average school in the United States of America, on whatever you look at, if you look at it during the span of one year, the average kid will move on that curve about 40% of a standard deviation or an effect size of 0.4. And here's why that's important. Because if we know kids are going to move about that far every year, any intervention we use that has an effect size that's less than that is worthless. They were going to give you a bigger effect by not doing that, even though that thing is evidence-based. This is the work of a guy named John Hattie. John Hattie wrote a book called Visible Learning, and the idea here is this. Any intervention you use that's not big enough to see isn't going to make a difference in, in terms of making that kid more successful and making that instructional circle start working. We have to use things with big effects. So what John Hattie did, and this was really the, the brilliance of what John Hattie did, is he went out and looked at every study he could find on every intervention you can think of. So he looked at, for instance, homework. How many studies have there ever been done on homework? Put every kid that's ever been in a study like that into one of those normal curves and then ask this question. What's the average growth you get by doing homework? And he can give you a number. Here's what the effect is of that. He did that for reinforcement, for different kinds of instruction, for engagement, for all of these things. And he built these little barometers for them. The Point four is where he calls it the breaking point. Above that is the zone of desired effects. Now, I'm not going to spend the whole day talking about John Hattie, but I am going to show you. What he's done is he's looked at every intervention he could find in the world and every study he could find on them. These are sometimes in the 20 to 30,000 different kids or studies that he's looking at. And he said, right now, our best evidence is this will give you this big of an effect. So I'm going to use those to talk about what should we be doing. Or, just to kind of cut to the end here, this is what we're talking about. A, are the kids in your school or your classroom? Or A could be one kid you're thinking about. Those kids or that kid are unique. There are certain age, culture, uh, skills, deficits, likes, dislikes, and you want them to do C. When I say what's 2 plus 2, I want them to say 4. The P stands for what's the probability that will actually happen. Now I could say, well in B, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home every night and think really happy thoughts about that kid's math. <laughs> okay, I can do that really easily. What's the probability that will have an effect on C? I had never seen the study on this, but I'm guessing that it doesn't have any effect. So now you can go to the literature, or you can go to the bookstore, or you can go whatever and say, which one of these curricula, or which one of these interventions should we choose? There's 50 of them. There's 1,000 of them. My question would be, of all the things out there that you could do, what does our evidence say gives you the best chance of being able to say tomorrow to that kid, good for you? Because if you can't, you have created another failure. Or you have been a party to another failure. And it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. Because what we do in education is trial and error. The issue for us is those trials should be based on a really educated guess and not a random one. 
So if you say, what would make this P be as big as it could possibly be? And, and let me tell you, it's never going to be 100. This is not medicine. In medicine, you can say, the problem with A is a cootie. We'd like the cootie to die. B is a shot that kills cooties, 100%. <laughs> In education, it's kids not reading well. We want them to read at grade level. What do you got? Well, we don't have a sure thing. We've got best probability things. If you take all of the things we've got and think of them in terms of what we would call high leverage practices, which aren't interventions, but they're the things upon which interventions should be based, they are these things. Do you have a curriculum? I don't care whether it's hallway, restroom, or math, or reading, or science, or social studies. Have you said, this is what we're learning, this is why it's important, this is the rule? Do you have a curriculum for it? Second, engagement. Are you having a back and forth with kids where they're thinking and doing and not just listening? Next would be, do you have very clear expectations for how much is enough for me to say good for you? I'm sorry? I did not. The environment, consistency, clear rules, routines, arrangements of the physical environment, the amount of time we spend, and feedback. Here's what's important about that set of things. That set of things together offer a bigger effect size for behavior change than do medication or psychotherapy. That doesn't mean we don't need medication or psychotherapy. It means before we use medication or psychotherapy, we should be using this because it gives you a better chance. What happens if we do all that and it doesn't work? Then you start looking for the next thing. But if this is our best probability, it's where we should start. And you think of that really as the logic of multi-tiered systems. Multi-tiered systems should start with a foundation of this. Now, it's going to look different potentially for every kid. Nobody gets to have no engagement. But the way I engage a little kid versus a high school kid is going to be different. It's still engagement. So what we have to think out as teachers is, how do I use each of these pieces given the kids I have and what I'm trying to teach? But those things are the things. So across everything we do, I'm going to keep coming back to those things because they're that important for us. So here's the wager. Inside this door right here, is a classroom filled with middle school kids. You've never seen them, but you know middle school kids. We've got a brand new teacher standing here who just graduated. They have a teaching certificate, so we know they know everything. We're going to open that door, throw them in there, and lock the door for a week. If during that week, we're watching on video cameras. If during that week, those kids are on task 80% of the time, and nobody needs to be restrained or secluded, you guys all win your entire life savings over again. I've been able to work with the conference providers here, and I have taken control of your retirement account. If you have an iPad now, check right now. It has a zero balance. I have it. I've taken it to Vegas, and I've bet it on this teacher. That's how important it is that this works for you. If you know that, what would you like to say to that teacher before we throw them in the room and lock the door? Is there one magic word of advice that would make everything okay? There isn't. I've got a million things I want to say. But what's going to happen is we're going to put them in there. Now what we do is, the good news part of this is we all go to Las Vegas and we sit at the sports book. But we're not watching football, we're watching videos of this classroom. <laughs> and when these kids are all on task, we're ordering the drinks and we're having a good time because double your retirement. But you also know, no matter how good a job that teacher does of managing a classroom, there's going to be one kid that screws it up for all of us. <laughs> so that teacher going in there not only has to know how to manage instruction in the classroom, but needs to know how to manage the one you're all thinking of right now. <laughs> And if they can't, it's not going to work for anybody in there very well. This is what we know. This is 
kind of our latest, and this is a great article, by the way, it's, you'll see in the handout. This is a kind of a latest, what the research says about how the brain learns. The way they've described it here is, your long-term memory is like the hard drive on your computer. It's storage. We put things in there. Having all that storage doesn't do you any good. You have an external hard drive right here. Without a CPU to go in and pull stuff from it, it doesn't do you any good at all. Your short-term or working memory is the CPU. And here's what happens. As you have an experience in life, it puts an example up into your long-term memory. There's one. Later, if you have a real issue in the real world and you want to solve that, your working memory goes to look for those examples. If all you have up there is one example and it doesn't look exactly like what you're trying to do, you get an overworked working memory very quickly and frustration that, that in, typically ends in people giving up or becoming angry and frustrated. However, if during instruction, I'm very purposeful as the teacher and I say, I need to give them an example that looks like this because some math in the world is going to look like that. And we've got these in their real world, they're going to see these problems. And I've thought out, these are the examples you need to get. And I've made sure that they get all those examples and it builds up more examples in their long-term memory. You get much more efficient and effective outcomes for learning. What we know is students with deficits in their learning, whether you call those disabilities or not, students with deficits in their learning have an even harder time when instruction doesn't include a range of examples. We need to be thinking ahead. What kinds of examples will I need to make sure that curriculum sticks with those kids? So again, it's not like one thing. It's you have to think about who your kid is and then think about how these things make sense. So if we're really going to talk about an effective instructional sequence, this is it. And I'm going to show you the data on this in just a second. First, again, this is, this is what we're saying right here. If you had a kid that we were trying to teach something and I said to you, you'd get $1 million if it worked, you have the best chance of getting that million dollars if the instruction looks like this. This does not say this is the only possible way to do it or the only possible way to make it work. It's simply the highest probability of this working. One, tell them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how much. Connect it to their life. Second, Model and demonstrate all of the key skills and concepts, but don't model in silence. Model and say, what do you think I'm doing now? Why would I be doing that? How? There's an engagement inside the modeling. Three, guide kids through the practice. Don't just set them off to do it somewhere. Guide them through. And what we're really saying is here, set them up for repetitive successes before we set them off to do more on their own. After we've set them up to be very successful with our guided practice, then they can do authentic practice. And finally, we want them to do that without us at all. That's called mastery. So I'm just going to go back to, again, probability. These are John Hattie's results. Direct instruction has an effect size of 0.59. Whole language has an effect size of 0 0.06. It's just the facts that we have right now. And this is based on every study that they could find. If you look here at where the big effect sizes come, these are all giant effect sizes. How many people in here have ever heard of project follow through? I talk about this a lot and nobody's ever heard of it. Project follow-through is the most expensive ever federally funded research project in education. The idea was, started back in the 60s, why is everybody arguing about how to teach reading and math? Let's find out what works best. So what the federal government did is they got, literally they've spent over a billion dollars on this. They found all these groups that said, we teach reading the best and they gave them money and they said, 
Go put your intervention in place, but you've got to do it on the kids we give you. And these were in mostly really urban areas, Chicago, uh, Baltimore, uh, Dallas, San Diego, et cetera, around the nation. So they said, you think you're really good at this? Here's millions of dollars. Those are the kids. Go do it. And the idea was, we'll randomly assign these kids to all these different groups, and we'll study which of those groups gets the biggest effects for reading and math with these kids. So as it got started, there became an argument. And some of the groups said, I'll tell you right up front, we aren't going to have the highest achievement scores, but we'll have something more important, problem solving. So as part of the evaluation, the feds put in some problem solving, some cognitive uh, tests to see if kids were indeed having better problem solving. There was a, a smaller group of a couple of places that said, oddly, we'll stipulate up front that our kids won't read better or problem solve better. But that's not what's important. It's self-esteem. Our kids will have way better self-esteem. So they put this in place. They ran it. It ran for over 20 years. Here's the published results. The dark bar is achievement. The checkered bar is problem solving. And the slashed bar is self-esteem. Notice that the self-esteem groups all lost ground in all three, including self-esteem. What they found was the more success you had with the instruction, the higher the self-esteem. You don't get self-esteem from being told to have self-esteem. You get self-esteem from success. What did the group do that had the highest results? They did this. The teachers, the curriculum, set up what is the rule for the day and how does the teacher present that in a direct and engaging way. So it had to involve the teacher saying, what do you think, multiple times. It had to involve the teacher modeling and it had to involve frequent feedback on those pieces. Or what they called direct instruction. What I'd like to do is just take that logic and break it into five big ideas for managing behavior. The first one is going to be developing those expectations and connect them to larger concepts to leverage prior knowledge. So again, let's go through and see. Teacher considers what's necessary to facilitate success. The teacher has responsibility for delivering that. And there's high levels of engagement within that. Now, I want you just to compare this again to the other things that we know. This is the effect size for teaching kids to solve a problem. The effect size for teaching kids how to solve a problem is 0.61, a very big effect size. The effect size for simply giving kids a question and asking them to solve that in order to learn, the effect size there is 0.31. The effect size for simply giving them a problem and saying it's a problem or project, learn by that, the effect size is 0.15. However, if you take the inquiry-based or the project-based learning and you do the problem solving first and then go there, those effect sizes go way up. It's all about how do you set kids up to be successful? It doesn't say, as I hear people saying, we shouldn't use inquiry-based things or we shouldn't use project-based things. It says, do what you need to do to set kids up to be successful with whatever it is they're doing. If you don't set them up to be successful, there's a good chance they won't. And, and I always say this also, I don't think my son needed this. My son just did great no matter what. And I bet you all have kids that might be similar. But the kids that I teach, kids with a history of disabilities, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, and kids with deficits, that doesn't work. You have to give them the setup to make it work for them. If they try once and don't get it, they're going to give up. You have to guide the success in order to get that to move. But when we talk about behaviors, this is what we seem to come back to all the time. Teachers just tell kids what not to do. This is not effective instruction. As it says, Ms. Bentz liked to go over a few of her rules on the first day of school. Ms. Bentz has a lot of rules. Kids can remember three to five things by context. So 
Which of those aren't going to stick? Number two, these are not telling you what to do. These are telling you what not to do. You don't teach math like this. Nobody ever says, here's the problem, and on the board are 12 answers that are wrong. Don't use those, because that doesn't make any sense. Instead, we teach how to. So when we're developing expectations, think about the logic of effective instruction. Tie your classroom rules and your individual rules to bigger things. Like in PBIS when we say, have those ideas for the school, respect other people, be responsible. That's not so that we can develop posters for the hallway, although that's what I think people think of that's for. <laughs> the purpose of those big ideas is to give you anchors to tie all the little things we want to do. So you've got a rationale. Why would that be the right thing to do? What if we had this rule in class? Why would that make sense? How would that be respectful? You've got a place to tie it. If all you do is walk in and go, shut up, I've got five rules. It isn't effective any more in behavior than it would be in science. So tie those to the anchors. Every rule that you have must be taught. Everybody's got rules. It's the, oh yeah, I didn't really model them and talk to the kids about them part that seems to miss. If the rules are there, they need to be stated positively. The thing we always talk about there is the dead man's test. Any rule you have that a dead man can do is not an appropriate rule. Tell kids what you want them to do, not not do. Keep them short, three to five, make them public, and talk about them all the time. So again, here might be an example of the PBIS thing with respect yourself, respect others, respect property. Those are your school rules. What do those look like in the hallway, in the classroom, during reading? They're everywhere you go, but they're going to have slightly different examples. And here again, we go back to that brain model. It's not enough to say, respect yourself. It's got to be respect yourself, and here's an example from reading. Here's an example from the hallway. Here's an example from the restroom. Here's an example from math. Here's an example from independent work time. Now when I go out in the real world, I've got a range of examples to choose from, and they're all connected under that one thing called respect. But if we haven't anchored it, and we haven't taught that range of examples to connect it, they're either missing in long-term memory, or they're just randomly set out there. And if your CPU has to search every example on the hard drive to find something, it's not going to work. We can take that then and just turn it into a curriculum. One of the things I like to point out to people is this is not for the kids. And I've, I've had schools that make this and then put it up on the wall and consider that teaching is done. That's kind of like taking the math book pages out of the book and pasting them on the wall and saying, I've taught math already. This is not instruction. It's curriculum. Now what we have to do is teach it. And that can be broken out and be put places where it serves as a reminder. But what I like most is when I see this is a teacher will say to a kid, is that a good example of being responsible right now? Why? Why not? And that question takes us back to the instruction and it builds another example that's being solidified under that category in my long-term memory. But we the adults have to create that schema to make that work. Number two, devise an environment to set kids up to be successful. We've got a, a study, set of studies that we've been doing at Louisville for several years now where we go into classrooms and we watch teachers and kids and we code what they do. We have over 8,000 observations of individual teacher-student dyads in classrooms all over the place. And one of the things we code is, during 15 minutes at the beginning of instruction, how much of that time when the teacher's supposed to be talking about what we're doing and what the connections are and how it's good for you and modeling it with a lot of engagement and feedback, how much of that time is spent with the teacher doing that versus doing none of that? So in order for us to turn off the timer during that 15 minutes, the teacher would have to be not doing anything with curriculum and not even looking at kids. So if you're writing on the board, that's curriculum. If you're reading to the kids, that's curriculum. If you're walking around monitoring what they do, we'll call that curriculum. The only way we code know is if you're not looking at them and not doing anything. These are those outcomes. 
In elementary and middle school, this represents about 3,600 schools. This represents about 1,000 schools. In the average elementary and middle school, during instruction, 93% of the time is spent with a teacher teaching, which is good. I, I can't tell you what the other 7% is, but 93, I think, is okay. But it drops when you get to high school. This represents almost 2,000 different high school classrooms we've looked at. In the average high school classroom, the teacher teaches during the first 15 minutes where the setup of instruction, 72% or 28% of that time is spent with the teacher not talking, demonstrating, or even looking at kids. Now, when I show that data, I think this is what everybody thinks that I'm saying is going on in classrooms. <laughs> and it's not. I don't go do the coding anymore because I'm not very good at it. But the people that I have doing this for me, I ask them all the time, what do you see teachers doing? And they say, they say, get in here, hurry up. Here's what you guys need to do. And then they go and do paperwork. And as a former special ed teacher, I get it. However, what we've been trying to get people to understand is, remember David Berliner, engagement, achievement, gravity, in physics. This and this have the same outcome in terms of predicting kids. We've got to figure that part out for the engagement because going on like this isn't giving us the outcomes we need. And here's how we know. If you were to take that 28% of high school time. And I'm guessing we're getting the best we're going to get because we don't code bell to bell. We only code during the instruction part. But let's say it was always that good. If you multiplied that 15 minutes times four to get an hour, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to a year, the average high school kid misses two and a half months of school while sitting in class getting no instruction from teachers. That's a problem because engagement equals achievement and the way we've set our instruction up doesn't maximize engagement. So I've got a video here that's real. This really happened. This is an eighth grade classroom in Louisville. And we adopted this school. We said, hey, you guys, we'll, we're willing to come to you anytime you want something and it's free. What do you need? And nobody ever called. <laughs> and in October, this brand new teacher called and said, I am not having success with the kids in my class. And I said, great, I'll come out, I'll watch, we'll have a talk. So this is the first time I was ever in that classroom shot with my iPhone. So, this went on for most of the class, this basic kind of thing. And afterward, this is an hour class, right after lunch. Afterward, we had a little debriefing session. I said, what do you think? And she was clearly exhausted. And she said, you know, this doesn't work. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I'd stop doing that. And she said, but this is what I was taught to do when I took my classroom management course, just to raise your hand. I said, actually, what you're supposed to do is teach kids that this is what that means. She says, I think they know. They do. But you haven't made clear in my classroom, this is an expectation. And when I do this, you do this. And so they're waiting for you to do that. And when you didn't, they thought, this is awesome. <laughs> we can play this lady. And they're having a blast in this class. Can we ask where the kid in the red shirt went? Yeah. He's, there's another set of desks over here. And he kept dragging his stuff over. She'd call him back. And then he'd drag it over again. Um, so there are several things that I'm worried about here. One is. School starts in mid-August in Louisville. It's mid-October. We've gone two months of this. This is going to be hard to fix because these kids, like I said, are having a blast. And they're going to reject us saying party is over. 
<laughs> Second, you're not going to be able to change this classroom by standing at the front. No. And you can't get in the middle of it because it's all jammed in. I don't know if the kids did this or if this is, I think they've figured out we can get jammed in and nobody can come in and get us. I would rearrange the furniture in this classroom if this were my classroom. And then you're going to have to have a lesson that engages them. And that was another thing we really talked about is once she did get their attention, the lesson went nowhere and the kids were off again. That's got to be your responsibility. You've got to hook them. You've got to find a way to make them want to be here. So I'll show you some more videos of this. What ended up happening was I decided to stay and work with her. I was there every day for three weeks working with this classroom. I prodded and um, cajoled my doctoral students to come with me. There were times we had four adults in the room at one time. Divide and conquer. How can you create successes? I have a hard time creating successes across 20, 30 kids, but it's gotten too far gone to make that happen. We talked about the schedule. Here's what we know. The more consistent your schedule is on a daily basis, the better. The more kids can predict what's going to come next, how it's going to come next, how much of it will do, the smaller the chances of problems. Now here's what you have to ask. How much consistency do the kids in my room need? And I'll bet you there are classrooms out there where you could do something randomly different all the time and the kids would be fine. But that's not what most classrooms are like. And if you've got one kid in your classroom who really needs consistency, you pretty much have to be that consistent for the whole class. It's kind of a lowest common denominator thing. So you know, if you're dealing with kids with autism, this isn't a good idea, it's a must. If you're dealing with kids with other more significant disabilities, but even what I found is our adjudicated kids, etc., it's the same deal. You have to create for them a schedule that sets them up to know what's coming next. You get much better outcomes. One thing I really had a problem with in the classroom I just showed you was kids would come bolting in that room and just scream and yell and run around while she was taking roll. And then she would say, sit down. And it took 10 minutes to get everybody to sit down. And I kept saying to her, you need to have expectations for every moment kids are in that room. Just teach them. When you walk in my room, inside voice, go to your desk, get out a pencil. There's got to be something to do. And any of us who have ever been teachers know that. And when you guys get done with this, you can do this or this or this. It's the same idea. As a BD teacher, this is the worst thing someone could say. And when you're done with that, find something to do. They will. And you'll be sad. So it doesn't matter that you have a particular thing. It is something. You have to have expectations for all the times you have kids in your classroom. And the times when she didn't have expectations, it went berserk. Sequencing and length is a big one, too. The one I hear this one with most is, um, and again, I deal a lot with the self-contained DVD rooms, sustained silent reading is driving me nuts. Why? Because these kids cannot read sustained silently without having a blow up. And I'll say, let's just do, go back to Las Vegas on this because these are probabilities. What's the over under number of minutes kids in your room could read silently before somebody did something to disrupt it? Four. So then I would say this to them. To have them read for three and a half minutes, stop them and say, what are you reading? That sounds interesting. Anybody else read that? And then say, go again. We can't do that. It has to be 30 minutes. You're telling me that the, the, the rule is set your kids up to fail no matter what. I don't believe that's what the rule is. You cannot create a set of routines and a sequence of activities that set kids up to fail. And I've had schools that I've worked with that say, we're going to do two-hour reading block in the morning, and, and I'm all for increasing the reading time. But what I've observed in many of those schools is an hour of reading, not followed by an hour of reading, but followed by an hour of arguing about reading. And I said, what you've done is shot yourself in the foot. The whole purpose of having two hours of reading is to get kids more successful. You're setting them up for more failure. Separate those hours, have activities that come and go in different ways during that, have breaks. But you can't just do it and say it's failing and keep doing it. You have to create a schedule that works for your kids. You plan and teach everything and explain. 
if there's going to be anything different. So this is my first time ever with this group. Back to the real world. I have a lot of experience dealing with really challenging behaviors and I'm very confident in my ability to do that. So I walked in here very cocky and said, I'll take over today, you just watch. And I walked in there, oh, I need some attention, here's what we're gonna do. And not one kid looked at me. And it was like that the whole day. They'd never seen me, they didn't know who I was, and they totally ignored me and it was like pulling teeth. This is the, how intense this became. Look how hard, this is again the very first time I'm with them. Look how hard I'm trying just to get everybody with me. This is kind of one of the things I do when I talk about individual kids having problems is stop, give a single direction, single, stick with it, repeat it, and when they're successful say great, thank you, and then move to the next thing. Do the same thing with an entire class. So I basically just ended up saying to this kid, what's your name, and then saying to everybody. Once I got everybody focused, then I got to say the next thing, which lasted for three seconds before we had to do this again. And getting people's attention literally meant getting into the room with them and getting their attention. Again, I did this for three weeks. It's absolutely exhausting. During this three week period, I drank a lot, kicked the dog when I got home, all those things, you know. And I thought, and she has to do it all day, every day. When you get into that position, it's learned helplessness. But it didn't have to be that way. We let it go too long. We didn't create the successes early, and that's going to be harder to do it now. And it would be the same logic if we let kids go with failure at reading for a long time. And you just go, hey, let's go read. And they say, because why should I? That's, that's aversive to me. I can't do that. I know I can't do that. So why would I do it? So what I used to do with my adjudicated kids is put it on the board exactly what we're doing. I taught it. We taught it again. We went over it. And we held to this schedule to the minute. Because I learned this kind of the hard way. I learned that if you say to a 8, 15 to 17 year olds, hey, let's do math. They say no, except in way more colorful terms. Uh -huh. So I figured out it can't be my decision. It has to be the schedule. So I put it on the board and I would just go, hey, 940, time for math. And they'd say, oh, and I go, yeah, I know, I don't want to either, but it's the schedule. You can argue with the schedule, but it doesn't work. It's what it is. And so we would just do exactly what it said. The other thing I realized was that if I said, hey, let's do another page, there'd be a mutiny. So I'd say right from the start, two pages. And instead of saying another page, I'd say, half done. But it's all in about prediction. If they can predict what's going to happen, they are OK with it. And we were able to run a pretty controlled room with those highly volatile kids because of the structure we created. Now again, not every classroom needs this degree of structure. And you have to ask yourself, what degree of physical arrangement, routine, consistency do I need given the kids I have and what I'm teaching? The next piece about the environment is seating. Where should the teacher's desk be and where should the student's desk be and how should they be arranged? I probably get this question as much or more than anything else people ask. With the teacher's desk part, generally my response is, if you're doing a good job of teaching, that's probably not a place you're going to spend a lot of time. But there are times when you're there and this is what I think you should think. When you are sitting at your desk, you should be able to see the eyeballs of every kid in the room. Some people have said, no, I like to sit in the back so they don't know if I'm looking at them. Like, I want them to know I'm looking at them, number one. Two, 
The kids that I taught, if I were in the back, they'd have spent their whole class doing this. Where is he? What's he doing? I want them to just look up and think, yep, he's looking. He's always looking. I don't need to think about it. I don't need to worry about it. So the next question is, should the kids' desks be in rows or circles or squares or pairs or dyads or... What's the research say? The research says that none is better than another. It depends upon what you want. If you want your kids to work together, put them together. If you want your kids to not work together, not putting them together works better. You don't always have the choice. I mean, sometimes if you're at tables like this, you don't have a choice of doing anything but tables. But you can assign seats. And I'm a big fan of the assigned seats. When I go into, in fact, the classroom you saw, after a couple days there, I sat down with the teacher and we devised a seating chart. And what we did on the first day is, that's up on the screen, hey, welcome to class, take a look up here, find your name and go find your desk. We're just randomly mixing this up so people sit in different places. That part was a lie. This was not random. This was very well thought out. Now, if today we get in here and I find out this was a bad idea, I will try really hard not to say, you guys need to split up because I will spend more time dealing with that than I would by not dealing with it. So what I'll try really hard to do is wait till the next day. I might teach my entire lesson of the day standing right here if I have to to make this work. Then tomorrow I say, hey look, randomly changed again. Find your name. And people go, that's weird. The only change was that these guys were mixed up. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> but it's totally random. And just make it work for you. Set that up to work for you. The sight lines thing is, don't put yourself in a position in that room where you can't see everybody. We have data out there, it's actually data from lawyers, that says the time kids are most likely to have anything dangerous happen to them is when teachers aren't looking. Duh. So you have to think out, maybe we shouldn't have desks that are around that corner in this room. Because any time you don't have a direct sight line to every kid, the probability for problems goes up. Traffic flow. Think how should kids go from point A to point B? Not a big deal for most classrooms. For my classrooms, that was a big deal. It's, you know, I was in a very small room with eight big adolescent boys. And if you've ever dealt with adolescent boys with severe behavior problems, you know, they don't get along with each other very well. So if I have to sharpen my pencil, that means I've got to walk past other humans, which is not my strong suit. And on the way by, I don't know what they say now, back in 1985, they would go, your mama, as they walked by. And that would be enough, what do you say about my mom? And then I'd have to deal with this whole thing. And so I just started developing simple rules for traffic flow. When you get up to sharpen a pencil, you go to the nearest wall and you walk along that wall to go to the pencil sharpener. Now that's a ridiculous rule, but it allowed me to say this a lot. Hey, you guys are really doing a great job of getting along. I'm impressed by how you guys are doing. It was a setup that I created, but somebody had to create that. Otherwise, all I'm saying every day is no, no, no. And if I want to say every single time these kids are successful increases the probability of another one, then I have to create a routine or a strategy or a trick to set that up to make it happen. In terms of proximity, we would like to see teachers moving through the room. And one of the problems with the classroom you've seen me in is that it doesn't lend itself to movement. I also like something called the one second rule, which means this. Every kid in here should believe that I could see their eyeballs in less than one second at any time I wanted to. Any time. If they believe that, it will inhibit problems. So the whole time I've been talking, she has been thinking about slapping her in the back of the head because it's just right there, it would be so easy. She cries and it's funny. The only reason she hasn't is because I've not given her an opportunity because I don't go over here and work with you guys like this because that's an opportunity. Because she could slap and I could turn around and she'd go, it wasn't me. So I don't do that. If I want to work with this table, I'm working right here. 
try it. <laughs> See, and I don't say try it to the kids, obviously, but they get, again, he's looking, he's looking, which allows me to do this. What was your name? My Betsy. Allows me to do this. Betsy, we've had a lot of conversations about hands to self, and you are nailing it today. I am really impressed. Good job. All right? Now, somebody could argue, yeah, well, the only reason she didn't do it is because you didn't let her. Thank you. That's called teaching. I've set up an environment where I make her successful again. Every time she's successful, sets her up to do it again. I've got to get one before I can get two. And yeah, for the rest of her life, I can't be watching her, but I've got to get some momentum going with success to build it. Same logic I would use if I was teaching reading or math. You've got to have guided practice. You've got to have setups to create success to provide the feedback. With the reactive proximity, I always talk about don't yell across the room about negative things. <laughs> so I'm over here, and everybody's working hard except for this table. And I go, hey, you guys get busy. Nobody's working anymore. Everybody's going, what's going on over there? Why did I drag everybody off task? So the way I like to think about this is if I walk by this table when I'm moving up through the room, good job guys, and I start doing my figure eight, and now I hear a commotion going on over here, do not yell, simply stop, turn, and make eye contact. My mom taught me this move. <laughs> if that works, you do this. I'll be right there and keep moving. Always say I'm coming back, even though you're really close. If that doesn't work, start saying positive things to other tables as you walk back there. Hey, I'm impressed, guys. Thank you. Great work, guys. We're almost done. Good job working. Back to the eye contact. Close proximity eye contact now. More than often than not, they go, oh yeah, and they just start working, and I didn't say anything. And then I say what I said to them. Hey, it's a great job because they're almost done with this. And then they go, yeah, good job. Now I'm saying, I'll be right back to see if it's still going okay, and keep moving. If they don't ever, start with a question. And the question is a correction question. It's to set them up to tell you if they know what's going on. So, hey, what's everybody supposed to be doing right now? Do you guys remember? Somebody will probably say it, and then I say, yes, show me that. Thank you. I'll be right back to see how it's going. If they say, I don't know, then I say, here's what it is. You got to do this step, this step, this step. How many of you have done number one? Looks like none of you. So number one's the first one. Show me working on number one. Okay, keep that up. I'll be right back and keep moving. If this just keeps happening, there's going to be a point where I might start moving less, and a lot of my movement is right through here. Because again, that gives me more, and I can still talk to these guys, but I'm going to position myself in the classroom in the space where I can set myself up to go, still doing it right, still doing it right. This is an over-exaggeration, but how do I get myself to be able to say legitimately good for you? And I think there is a misunderstanding there sometimes, and people think, as long as I just say good for you a thousand times a day, that counts. It doesn't. You can't just say, hey, you know what? Give, your all, give yourselves all 20 pats on the back for doing a good job. That counts as 20. That doesn't work. First, you have to get a behavior. Then you can give a reinforcer. Reinforcers without behavior don't count as reinforcers. So first, you've got to make them do it right. Then you can say, hey, good job doing it right. So good instruction has to precede effective feedback. This is a made up video that will be on the website when that website is finally published. This one, this is a kid at the back of the room and what he's doing is <clears throat> he is off task but I can't go stand at the back of the room because I've got other things going on. So I'm going to give you a bet. If that kid will come up to the front of the room and sit with me, you all get a thousand dollar bonus on the way outside this room today. Here are two choices you have. I could do this. You, up front, now. Here's my other one. Hey, come here, I want to show you something that's really cool. Bring your book. Which one is more likely to let me say to that kid, good job, thank you. So it's a lot of this is 
how you frame that when we go. Now once I get that kid up front, what I want to do is teach. Give him very clear expectations. While I'm giving those expectations, guide his practice. Guide his practice, give feedback, continue to look at everybody else, and then back off as he's doing it. Timmy has difficulty remaining on task during independent work. He is falling behind because he's not completing his work. Hey, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here, I want to show you something. Bring, bring your stuff, I'll get your book. Come up here, I want to show you how to do this. It's really simple. Excellent work, guys, thank you. Hey, you know how to do this, man. This is really simple. Look, three steps. Read the problem, find the match over here, and then write the match down. So, look at this first one. So you read that. Where's the match over here? Show me. Yeah, exactly. Now all you gotta do is write that down. So, write that down right there for me. Perfect, yeah. Go ahead and do the next one. The teacher has considered how to place Jimmy in a way Excellent, that allows guys. more We're frequent done. contact. You guys are have this done. To make this work, the teacher time. will also keep moving while keeping an eye out for yeah, Jimmy. Exactly. You can do this. In addition, the teacher is explicit with Jimmy, showing him what he needs to do and providing frequent reminders. Have some free time. Let me see. What you so Again, that doesn't mean he has to sit right there all the time, but when he's off task, I have to figure out a way to put him in a place where I can continue to do what I do. I love these round tables as a teacher because I can put five round tables around here with four or five kids at each one. I can get 20 kids really quickly, and I can be at any table in three steps. So I can be standing here working here, and I can go over here, one, two, three, and talk to any kid, and in a couple steps, and I can be right back, it allows me to cover the room really quickly and easily. So I really like it when it's set up like that, but it isn't always set up like that. Big idea number three, be direct and explicit. Don't make them guess. Don't make them figure it out on their own. Tell them and show them. Again, go back to our model we have to create this. I'm going to do a little activity with you that will set you up here to think about instruction. I'm going to teach you a new skill today. It's a skill that's really important in this particular class that you're in. The class that we're in is colorful geometry. And I've got a new skill I want to teach you. It's called OSH. Now here's what I'm going to do. I don't believe in direct and explicit. I think it's better if you just discover it on your own. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you all out on a field trip. You, I'm going to let you be my first classroom ever. You are my eight adjudicated adolescent boys. And we're going to go walk around campus. And in that campus, we're going to find examples of OSH. I'm not going to tell you what OSH is because that would ruin the whole discovery mode. So right now, when you see this first example of OSH, what could OSH be? It could be a green triangle. It could be a blue rectangle. It could be a blue rectangle, but only if it has green in it. It could, it could be a million things. So let's do more examples. But they've got to be real. So where we live, there are only so many examples of Osh that occur in nature. As we walk down the path, hey, look, it's another Osh. What would you just learn? I don't know what's important here, but I know that if blue is important, it doesn't have to have green on it. Okay, let's continue. Hey, look over there up in that tree. It's another osh. <laughs> What'd you learn here? Actually, I don't think there's any new information here. Every example should allow you to go, oh, none of that was right. This is. These examples are so similar that in your brain you aren't able to create a class of examples connected to a rule. So one problem is no rule. Second problem is no range of examples for a rule. But here's what we'll do. Let's come on back in the classroom and do some practice. Tell you what, raise your hand if you think this one's Osh. Finally. <laughs> this is in fact Osh. Excellent job. Tell everybody how you knew this was Osh. It looks the same. 
I know what part of it makes it be ash, or what parts of it make it be ash. Colors in the shapes. Which shapes? Which colors? Mm -hmm. Never mind. I thought you were with us, and it, it, <laughs> ignore her. She's I don't know. She's I think she's messing with us. Um, here's another one. Raise your hand if you think this one's ash. You think so? It is. How'd you know? You're not even close. <laughs> Let me give you some feedback though. No. Okay. All right. Here's what I think we should do for more authentic activity. I've put at the back of the room a bunch of colored paper and I want you to make some osh. Now the only scissors I could find I got from the custodian and they're like this long and daggery, really sharp razor like. If my eight kids don't know what osh is, what other things might they do with those scissors at the end of the period? Okay, so this is not very good instruction. And here's what's wrong. One, I didn't give you a rule, I didn't tell you, I didn't make this connect to you in any way. Two, the only examples you saw were natural. Here's the problem with that. The real world has every example you need to teach, but the real world doesn't select and sequence them like a teacher. You might get the same example every single time and that is not helping to build that long-term memory that you need to be effective. Then I have practice that sets you up to believe you can't do this. Every time we have practice, I end up saying, no, wrong. And now you guys hate this before we ever get to the next part. And so anything that looks like it could conceivably be a little bit more entertaining than Osh is probably where I'd like to go. Let's do it again. But this time, I'm still not going to tell you what it is, although that's what I should do. But I just want to show you the power of thinking out how to make kids get it by the examples we select. Here's Osh. Here's the second one. Now this doesn't appear in nature around here. I had to get this one off the internet. <laughs> What'd you just learn? Triangles, Triangles are irrelevant. Here's another one. What's the only thing in common across those three examples for colorful geometry? <laughs> now, as the teacher, what I've done is I've showed you three examples of Osh, but I've showed you in every one of those a whole bunch of things that aren't Osh that came with the selection of those examples. This is the idea that you can't just set kids free to do all of this. You have to provide them with the examples to make it have the schema for them. Now, I'm going to show you what it isn't. When I show you what it is, I change as many things as possible except for the rule. When I show you what it isn't, we change only the rule. Hmm. Now let's practice. Ooh, this is a weird one. Haven't seen one like this. You think this is Osh? Yes. Yeah. 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 It is Osh. How'd you know? The, re the rectangle around it is red. The rectangle around it is... You have a gift at this colorful geometry stuff. Remind me to tell your mom that maybe you should be in an AP class because you are really... Good. What my instruction does is it sets that up. Good instruction sets up... That's the relationship that I was talking about at the beginning. That sets this up. Now, even though that was a pretty basic thing and she just maybe stumbled into it, that's one. And you got to get one before you can get two. Oh, here's another one just like it, except it's smaller. So this one's Osh, right? Oh, no. do, do you think this is Osh? No. <laughs> Why not? It's not right. Oh, right. It's got two rules. It has to be four sides. I screwed up on that one. Good catch, you guys. You guys really were way smarter than me on this one. How long do I have to do this? until I believe that when you do it without me, you're going to get it right. So if we're doing this and you guys are answering me right every time, your turn. There's one more thing though that I want to do. I want to think out. <clears throat> I'm going to set you up to do your project next. We got project-based learning that this, that's based on this. But I have a feeling I know where you might have problems in your project today. So here's some instruction I'm going to do ahead of time. Everybody, is this a rectangle? Okay, I just want you to think really hard. Don't say anything, just think. Is it still a rectangle? Yeah, rectangles can swivel and it's got four sides with right angles. It's still a rectangle. Okay, 
Think hard on this one. Is this Osh? Now the reason I'm showing you this one is because I know it's coming up in your project today. And I want for you to be set up to be successful with the project. So good teachers are always thinking ahead, what other examples do I need for these kids today to set this up to make it work for them? Now, will we have no stabbings today? <laughs> Not necessarily, because there's no 100%. There's just higher probability. I would say the probability of a stabbing has gone down dramatically during this, but it doesn't go away because it's the real world. So, be physically and verbally explicit. Tell them, show them, engage them, guide them, which just takes us to the next part. Modeling. Modeling has a big effect size. Modeling is 0.57. What we know is that repetition builds fluency. You aren't going to be able to have high predictors for success if you can't do it automatically. Like we always talk about that with reading, an automaticity with the code. If you have to stop and think a long time to sound those words out, comprehension goes away. So we need automaticity. You get automaticity with rules, routines, strategies, and skills through repetition. However, here's what we know makes repetition work. Lots of repetition all at one time, bad. Little bits of repetition with high rates of success over time, good. When you mass what's called massing the practice, you get side effects. The side effects of massing the practice are kids that hate doing it, kids that try to escape, kids that call you names, you know the rule, the, the way it works. Spacing it out. We get done, you've got five little blips of doing it. Good, yes, good, yes, good. We stop, you do a little few more tomorrow. So we want to space out the practice, not mass it. The whole concept of drill and kill is a real problem. We don't want drill and kill. We want small repetitions of high rates of success repeated over a longer period of time. So we have to think, how do you set kids up? Think about all the little rules and things that you've got going on in your classroom and how you can create those and make it happen. If you were going to build posters on something like flush the toilet, which kid in your classroom would you pick to draw this poster? Mr. Non-Flushy should be the guy that does this because number one, He's getting way more engagement with this lesson than the other kids. He needs more engagement. So think about how you bring kids back into it when you're doing what you're doing. I've got a, well, I've got a video here in a second. Let's see. Um, questioning does not have a high effect size, which surprises people. 0.46. But it depends on how you question. I think we should be thinking of questioning not as assessment, but as engagement. So I would like to think that every question I ask, the kids can get right 80 to 90% of the time. So don't ask really hard questions as part of the engagement. Now you can use at the end of engagement when kids are feeling like they're really getting it, you can start to use some questions as assessment to see if they're mastering. But what we want, if you're going to have questions, is questions that kids can answer really easily. It's just used for engagement. What we find is when the teachers use questions that are super easy and the kids can answer really easily, it keeps the lesson moving. We get kids that are, have more engagement. We get kids that are less disruptive. And we get kids that report they like being in the classroom and like their teachers. <coughs> There's the relationship piece again. We build that through high rates of success in how we engage the kids. So we also code when we go into classrooms. How often did the teacher give the students opportunities to respond during instruction? Here's how you could give an opportunity to respond. Raise your hand if you agree with that. That's an opportunity to respond. It's a choral. 
Everybody say the word at the same time. Turn to your neighbor and tell them what you think about that. Draw that on your paper. Hold up a green card if you agree. Write that on your dry erase board and hold it. All of those are called OTRs, opportunities to respond. What we'd like to see is people doing those at a rate of three per minute during instruction. When teachers during instruction are using OTRs at a rate of three per minute, we get statistically lower rates of disruption and statistically higher rates of active engagement. Teachers control the probability of disruption through engagement. We see this over and over again. So we've got to figure out how we can use these best in whatever classroom you're in. So we've been trying out different things in all kinds of different classrooms. And what we find out is that in high school, response cards work really well. Just raise a card because you don't have to say something. And if I say raise your red card if you think it's wrong, raise your green card if you think this is right, I don't know isn't one of them. It's make a guess. And when you do make a guess and I can say that's right because, or that's wrong because, there's an engagement we haven't had before. Use these to make some sort of engagement. So we did a made up video. And in this made up video, I'm going to do six OTRs per minute. Six different OTRs. You could use the same exact one and we only need three per minute, but it's just to show that you can do this without being breakneck speed. But the other point I think is really important to make is you do not need to give three OTRs per minute all day. You need to do this during instruction. When kids go to their project and go to their other things, the OTRs are built in when they're doing their practice on their own. Only during instruction. All right, let's jump right into fractions. Who remembers what page we were on with fractions yesterday when we stopped? Yeah, what? 246. 246 is right. Could I see everybody turn to page 246, please? That's where we're going to start today. When you get to page 246, I'd like you to look for the part that says improper fractions. That's where we left off. Put your finger on it where it says improper fractions, please. Improper fractions, got your finger there? Okay, so if you see there, the step says how to divide. So I want you to look at this first one up here on the board. Raise your hand if you think you know the answer to this one. Yeah, what do you think the answer is to this one? Two. Hmm. She says that it could be simplified to two. Raise your green card if you agree with her. Lots of agreement. I agree also. It is two. Very good. That's exactly the way you do it. You divide. So if she's right and we divide, then what I'd like you to do is write down the answer to this one on your paper real quick. Okay, so notice that some were to the group, some were to individual. The data that we have right now says Results look good when you have a mixture of about four or five groups per every one individual. Doing individual only is, is a really bad way to do it because what happens is kids don't like being put on the spot as much. The other thing is, well, once I've been put on the spot once, I just relax because I know they're not coming back to me for a while. So it's better to do group, 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 and then individual. And those individual ones need to especially be ones with a, an extremely high rate of success for the kids. They shouldn't be put you on the spot or they're going to find ways to escape it. So back to this eighth grade real classroom. What I had to ask this teacher was, what is your curriculum? And she said, we are reading Flowers for Algernon out of the English book. What I haven't told you is this is AP English. Um, which, yeah, so one thing, I followed these kids to another class because I just wondered, are they nuts or something? And so I followed them to their next class where the teacher greets them at the door, grabs them. You're going to be good in my class today, aren't you? I know you are. Yes, I'm, I'm rooting for you. Throws them in the class. It's like really intense with each one of them. And uh, they're just perfect in that class. And I said to one of the, the girls that was sitting in the back, I reached over and said, how come you guys act so different in another class? And she says, this teacher won't put up with it. I've seen her take off her shoe and hit someone in the head with it. And I said, so you don't like her? And he goes, oh, no, she's our favorite teacher. And that really confused me because I thought, well, I can't go back to this other teacher and say, have you thought about hitting someone with your shoe? <laughs> it isn't the shoe. It's the relationship. 
The, and and I, let me state for the record, I disagree with the shoe part if that actually happened. But it's the relationship they believe she cares about them. And she can say, I'm going to call your grandma and tell her that you did a good job. They believe she cares. And the problem for me is I really can't teach this other teacher to have that persona. She just doesn't. So how do we get her to think about using strategies that do that? So I said, so tell me about this Flowers for Algernon. It, it's a short story. How long have you been doing this? The entire year so far. So this is like a short story they've been reading for two months. And she says, well, every day it just goes nowhere and we have to start over. So I said, what does your lesson plan look like? And she said, well, it's supposed to be I call on a kid to read a page, and while that kid's reading, the rest of them have a worksheet that they're filling out as we go. So I said, okay, well, let's just assume that I think that's engaging. How many kids are finishing their worksheets? And she says, well, we've never gotten anywhere, so no one's ever handed anything in. Okay, so I'm going to just not argue about this and say not engaging. So I'm going to go back to my length of activities. How long could one kid in your room read from this book before the others stop listening? Less than 10 seconds. All right? Then nobody reads more than about five seconds. I'm giving you like three sentences to read and I'm going to stop you. And when I stop you, I'm going to step into the middle of the group and I'm going to teach. I'm going to say, what was that last word she used? What does that mean? What would happen if you did? I'm going to make you guys engage with me. And so I'm asking her, watch this. Again, you aren't going to win this at the front of the class. You're going to need to move around and you're going to need to roll up your sleeves and force them to be engaged. And this is still that first day. This is still really hard. It's the grades. No. no. What, what's, what's the point of taking one of those tests where you look at that eight block that's weird? What are, you think, what are you supposed to see when you see that? Whatever you think, so, so what's the point? Why would you look at this ink one and say, I think it looks like this, who cares? What, what's going to happen? All right, so somebody's listening to you and saying, oh, this is the kind of thing they think about because he said something. So a couple things. One, I've got at least one doctoral student patrolling around the room, <laughs> redirecting kids that are off task. But I'm not going to give them an opportunity to get way off task. I'm going to keep the engagement going really fast. And then when they answer the question, read the next sentence. OK, so we just left off with what? I wonder what will happen next. Go. Two or three sentences stop. What did happen? And, I just, and again, this is kind of the way I think I might teach kindergartners. But these guys' attention right now can't do it in any other way. And that means I have to up the level of OTRs to get them back with me. This is a study we've done in um, Kentucky. We looked at the state data and we found how many schools are there that are Title I that have the highest possible ratings for achievement. There are 12. So I wrote to each of those schools and said, could we come and code your school? And 11 said yes. We matched them against. 11 schools that were Title I with the lowest scores in the state. But we matched them by demographics, et cetera. And we compared them using something called a hierarchical linear modeling. Long story short, there's one difference between high poverty schools that have the highest and lowest achievement, and it is the number of OTRs that teachers give. The average kid in a high poverty school with high achievement gets more than 260 additional OTRs per week. That's the only difference when you look at those schools. OTRs, engagement, make a big difference. Or as we said at the start, you know, engagement, achievement, is like the concept of gravity in physics. But these are zero rates. These are the percentages of classrooms we looked at in each area that used zero. So 12% of elementary classrooms we looked at never ever give a kid a chance to do something as a group and never 45% never give individuals a chance. By the time you get to high school, 21% of high school classrooms we looked at did not ever give kids a chance to do or say during instruction as a group. And 64% of high school classrooms never give an individual kid a chance to do or say. The 
one of the things that really concerns me is that resource rooms don't look very good either. Resource rooms should be the place where that is happening constantly. Specialized instruction to set kids up to be successful. I, I, I don't know what the resource room does for us if it doesn't increase engagement. Which leads us to big idea number five. Provide students with regular feedback on their performance. Providing formative evaluation has an effect size of 0.9. In John Hattie's book, if you look at everything that could happen at home, school, classroom, third, providing formative evaluation is the third ranked thing of all. If you look at goal setting, you get another big effect of 0.56 by not only giving them feedback all the time, but also having them feedback toward a goal. Here's where you go. So when we said at the start with that ABC thing, the part of that B box was expectations. Because when there are expectations, you now have a goal. And when we give you feedback, the feedback is feedback about your progress toward that goal. Simply saying to a kid, yes, correct, good for you, has an effect size of 0.73. It is of all the things a teacher could do at any moment in the classroom, there's nothing in terms of probability, there's nothing a teacher could do with a bigger probability for continued kid success than to tell them that they've done something right. But again, you can only do this when they do something right. And I do hear people say, I would love to say good job to that kid, he never does it right then I would say that's a teaching problem. What do we have to do with instruction to set that kid up to get it right? Well, that sounds like a lot of work. It is, sorry, but that's the only thing we've got. If we don't set it up, it's not gonna happen. This is all we're talking about though. And I like to say this out loud to schools often because when I start talking about reinforcement, they think we mean candy or goodies. And verbals is all we're talking about. I, I don't know what this sign means. I found it on the internet, but I think it makes the point. We saw you doing it. That's all we're saying when we say we're looking for kids doing it right. That's all we need is that acknowledgement. We can do that really well verbally. Really well verbally. It needs to be age appropriate. What I say to say good job to a preschool kid is going to be different for a high school kid, or it's not gonna work very well. It needs to be delivered with specificity to really have a bigger impact. So me just saying, Chelsea. me just saying, good, works, but if I wanna make that bigger, I can use a name and I can be specific. So this makes it bigger. Chelsea, good, that's more personal. <laughs> but I can also make it bigger with specificity. Sitting down again, great job, Thanks. Chelsea. So we want to mix up specificity of name and action to make those things more powerful, more salient for the kids. So you just need to be thinking, how big do I need to make that? A lot of times what people say is, well, that's not fair to the kids in my room that are doing it right all the time without getting that. Two things to think about for that. One is, they should be getting it. They should be getting the verbals too. They're probably not gonna get the great big one all the time that Chelsea gets because they don't need that. But they should already be getting bigger things. So let's say that I've got this table full of kids here that are doing a great job. They're getting their homework done every day. They turn it in, they don't have any problems. I should be saying this to them in the morning. You know, I just wanted to say thanks again to you guys. You're so responsible. I love having you in my class. All of you work really hard, and you should just really feel good about yourself. Right? What a great job you're doing. Then when I go over here and say, Chelsea, awesome, you showed up. <laughs> and people say, well, now they're going to say I should, I should not show up because I'd get that. They don't want this. <laughs> they don't want anything to do with this. The only way that becomes a problem is if I've never said, Good job to you guys. So if you want to be able to differentiate that verbal reinforcement, you've got to make sure that you're using it here. And it, it's not frequency here. It's this 
intensity. So I could do this once a day intensely and that'll hold you over for a whole bunch of these. But I have to be thinking and a lot of times what happens is I'm not saying good job to anybody and then I come over here and say, well, you're doing a good job. I say, what about me? Yeah. It's, it's because I haven't been saying it enough in other places. So in order to be able to differentiate, you need to raise up the frequency with which we use feedback in the first place. Level two, instead of verbals, or no, I shouldn't say it, in addition to verbals, we can also use privileges, but not made up privileges. Things that you are going to do anyway. So, <clears throat> Chelsea had a good morning. It's the first time in a while she has. So I can say, all right, let's go down to the cafeteria. Hey, Chelsea, you've had a great morning, first in line. We're going to the cafeteria and so is she, whether she's first in line or not, so this isn't a special thing. We were gonna do it anyway. The younger kids are, the easier this is to do. When they get older, then it's a little bit more challenging. But I was looking at a middle school one day following a kid that was having problems and they got up to go to a computer lab. When they get to the computer lab, a fight breaks out over who gets which computer. And they're all exactly the same. But I thought, here's a great opportunity to say, Chelsea, you had a great morning, first pick a computer. Again, it's a privilege that isn't even really a privilege because we're already here, you're gonna get one anyway. So keep thinking about how can I say to you, why don't you be the one that runs this to the office because you've had a good morning? How about if you get, find ways, why don't you come up and demonstrate this because you've had, find those ways to build in extra things for those kids that really need it without spending money, without inventing anything. Level three, <coughs> public acknowledgement. For those kids who like public acknowledgement, this is also free. The extra effort wall, the certificate, the bus rider of the month or week or whatever it is, those are all just a bigger way of saying thank you, good job. We just make it more public. Again, some kids don't like that and you need to know what kids do and don't like. The last level and the one that everybody thinks is first when I talk about this generally is handing out tickets. I have no problem with tickets except for this. It's a pain. Here's the biggest thing you get from tickets. Tickets make adults reinforce more. Kids, it doesn't matter. What happens when you give out tickets to adults is now they have to go down the hall giving out tickets. Take the tickets away, they go down the hall not doing anything to say. If they went down the hall every day saying, thank you, good job, you would never need tickets. You get as big an impact out of verbals as you do tickets, but adults don't do verbals very well. So, if you're going to use tickets, these are some things to consider. Don't do them all day, every day, all year. Pick and choose your spots, whether you're talking school-wide or classroom. Wow, this really, this transition routine is really getting rough. Go back to the kids and say, let's talk again about what the routine rules were. And then say to them, I'm going to be looking for those people looking at using those rules good today and I've got tickets. Make the kids practice doing it right by incentivizing it with the tickets. Lots of verbal praise, man, I'm impressed, lots of tickets. And then tickets go away and hold them. If you don't need them, don't pull them out. Second, don't allow kids to save them up. Whatever you get, you spend today because I don't want to have to think about this again. If I give out a homework pass, it's homework pass tonight. Done. If you don't do that, some kid's going to show up in April with a handful of these and go, I'm done for the year. <laughs> go away with it. When I was a teacher, I had a token economy system because I had to. If you don't have to have a token economy, don't have a token economy because it's a lot of work. If you need it, you need it. In my classrooms, I needed that level of structure to give that level of feedback. But a lot of times I think schools and classrooms think we need to have these systems in place for everybody. And I generally think that's not true. And again, I don't have anything against them. I just don't think they're necessary most of the time.
The other problem that comes along with the tickets is we're supposed to be fading them out. And if you're not fading them out, you're creating a new problem. Now we're reliant on the tickets. So that's why I would say if you're going to use them, burst them. Get rid of them again. But let your data on whether kids behavior is changing be the predictor of what you do. <clears throat> Which, this is just what I just said. So other ways to use tickets, if you put them in a lottery, you can give out one billion tickets today and you still only have one prize. Beauty of a lottery. So if you do say, wow, we really need tickets for that area for next month, give them out. Do not worry about inflation because every ticket is a better chance of winning if you just say you can use tickets to buy pencils. Once I get a thousand tickets, I don't care about your pencils. But these give me a better chance. So stick with, and these could be traded for privileges rather than goodies. This is a school in Utah, high school. Daily they did this, but daily they drew one and whoever got the ticket gets to park in the parking space right in front of the school. What if I don't have a car? Somebody might want to buy that from you. It became extremely valuable to have one of those tickets. And when it becomes extremely valuable, when you say, I'm going to be looking at tickets for the hallway today, look out there and watch these really tough kids walking like this. And you go, man, I am impressed. Great job. Thank you. That's very responsible. And a ticket. But use it to your advantage. When we talk about feedback, though, we have to also talk about negative feedback. Um, because we've got really good data that says if teachers don't have a bag of tricks for how to handle problems and challenges, their number one response will be, get out. And it's very reinforcing for teachers when kids get out. And it's very reinforcing for kids when kids get out. And every time I go to a school and they say, this is the detention room, I say, no, it's not. This is the party room. Every kid that's in here sleeping would rather be here. You're rewarding them. Now what we have to do is come up with what are some better ways of handling it when kids have misbehaviors. The way I like to do this is get the whole faculty together and I know there are teachers out there that do this really well and I'll say, I've heard a lot of complaints about kids bringing food to class and a lot of kids getting kicked out for having food. Does anybody have other strategies for that? I know you do. And you guys are going to say, you guys are going to say, well, when I have that happen, here's the way I handle it. So when I, yeah, when that happens, now if I'm the brand new teacher, unexperienced, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, there are other things besides kick them out. So when I say, what have you tried? And they say everything, I know that's not true because they don't know what everything is yet. So we've got to figure out a way to give them all those other things. And again, I could come up with a list, but my list isn't necessarily going to be good for the kids that you work with and their age and their conditions. So ask the people in the school that already do it. What we'd like to see ideally is correction. When someone does it wrong, instead of saying no, we say, why is that not the right way? Show me the right way. So we code these differently when we go watch. One's called a stop command. Don't. Stop. Uh-uh. Something like that. <clears throat> Even if it's do something else. Still a stop command. This is what we call a corrective command. It starts with a question. Hey, do you remember what the rule is? Could you show me that? Or what would be a better way? Hey, we talked about this yesterday, remember? What did we say would be better for you? Now that doesn't mean I can't still have a bigger consequence. Even if I'm going to suspend her. I can still say, well, we talked about this yesterday, remember? What would be the best way to do this to make sure you're doing it right? We have a correction, and then I say, yeah, but now you know we're gonna you're going to have to be suspended because of that. The correction should always come first. It's a teachable moment. So we want to see correction. What we found is if you just compute conditional probabilities, you can do this. Here's a kid being disruptive. Teacher says, stop. Five minutes down the road, will that kid be on task? Ten minutes down the road, will that kid be on task? Fifteen minutes down the road, will that kid be on task? 
We can compute the probability. Show me another one where the teacher says, stop. What's the way we should do that? Show me that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Keep doing that. Five, ten. What we can show is that when teachers use correction, kids are more likely to continue doing the right thing. And so we've talked about this over and over and over again. If you want kids to be better later in class, use correction. Here's the problem. They use, people out there in the world use correction so infrequently that we can't actually build a big enough data set to get the stats on this to make it publishable. So I can tell you what it says when you look at it in the small terms, but it literally, in 2,000 high school observations, we've seen corrections happen less than 20 times. It doesn't happen. So it's hard for people to say, I'm going to use that because it works because they absolutely don't use it. These are zero rates for positive and negative feedback. Again, 35, 3600 elementary school classrooms. 35% of elementary school classrooms never say or gesture anything positive to anybody during class. 58% of middle school and 71% of high school. We code for gestures as well as verbal. So if the teacher does this, we tally it. So if we say we want to have kids being really successful, and we want to acknowledge them when they do to set them up to be successful again, we're not doing it. So somebody, I guess, could argue, well, these kids are never doing anything right. Okay, my argument now would be, then why aren't we changing instruction? Because if it's not getting them to do it right, we should be doing it differently. We just simply do not use feedback very effectively. So we have looked at this. What's the probability of kids having problems if teachers don't do this? So we take this giant data, data set of 8,000 observations and we do something called a latent class analysis where we break it into here it's high, medium, and low use of OTRs and feedback. Now you go and look at all the teachers using low rates, which is a ton in our data set, and say, What's the probability of a kid being disruptive in that classroom? A teacher who uses low rates of feedback and engagement has kids that are 67% more likely to be disruptive. What teachers do in classrooms matter. So we started right out with that sentence. We've got the data. When teachers do certain things, we can predict certain things from kids. Whether they do or don't do certain things, we can predict outcomes for kids which is going to take us to the last thing. We need teachers to be understanding of these basic tenets. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do every one of these, but to be aware that it's very effective when this group is doing poorly to say, I'm looking for people doing this. Great job. As a prompt to then go, hey, you guys too. Get kids doing it right by using positives as much as you can. When you do have to confront kids, start with a question. Be corrective, be instructive with it. Use very specific directions to tell kids what to do. When they're not doing something right, say, could you show me this? Be very specific instead of get busy. Show me this particular thing. Um, again, a lot of these are basic kinds of bag of tricks things. But that's the point. When adults don't have a bag of tricks for instruction or for management, they tend to regress back toward, I'll say the least to that kid, and that kid will get more negative interaction. And we've done this research only with kids with behavior disorders. Once the teacher knows the kid has behavior disorders, regardless of the way that kid acts, the teachers will engage them less and use more negatives. That goes up higher when you talk about minority males. Just putting a kid in there who's a minority male will do the same thing with teacher behavior. Can't explain that, but that's what we see. Put a kid in a classroom that's minority male and automatically that kid will get less engagement and more negative interaction from the teacher regardless of their behavior. So I'm going to stop here for questions, but I'm going to remind you that if you go to this Facebook site, I will be posting 
more things to that through, throughout this conference. And there, is, there are links to these videos, but very quickly, I'm still hoping, that website will get up and running. And when it gets up and running, this will put an announcement there so you can go right there and there will be, I just gave the website people probably 80 videos to put up that would be public domain. So that's the best place to go for that.